Dr. Bassett, Dr. Mary Bassett, is the commissioner of the, of the health department for New York City. Dr. Bassett has more than 30 years experience in public health, and she has dedicated her career to advancing health equity. For more than 17 years, Dr. Bassett served on the medical faculty of the University of Zimbabwe and developed a wide range of AIDS uh, prevention uh, interventions. She also served as the Associate Director of Health Equity at the Rockefeller um, Foundation's Southern Africa office. And more recently, she has served as the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. She's, she served at the Doris Duke uh, Charitable Foundation as the Program Director for Africa Health Initiatives. Over her career, Dr. Bassett has tackled a wide range of very hot issues, including the AIDS epidemic, access to maternal care, universal pre-K, cigarette regulations, sugary soda and trans fat bans, and calorie counts at restaurants, only to name just a few. She says in, in an article, thanks to Google, <laughs> that one of the chronic conditions most people in the field aren't discussing is racism. And she goes on to say, I want to make clear that a conversation about racism isn't a conversation about blame. It's a conversation that should be forward facing because it's within our hands to change it. Dr. Bassett is speaking out, and she's here to speak with us. Dr. Bassett. Thanks, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. I want to start out by acknowledging the importance of what the BU School of Public Health is doing uh, under the transformative leadership of Sandro Galea. Uh, it's really important to use our academies as centers for convening uh, and centers for talking about challenging issues. And uh, I can't believe he's just been here for a year uh, and his uh, impact is already showing. And I also want to acknowledge him, particularly Dean Cox, who has been gentle and challenging and collegial in his facilitation this morning. And, also my co-presenters from whom I've learned so much. I'm the commissioner of a large health department. Uh, public health has a whole range of activities. We sometimes say from A to Z, from the air, and this week to Zika. Um, so I, you know, this is just is part of my portfolio. Uh, my overall arching go goal is to promote and protect the health of all New Yorkers, but by city charter. Uh, we have responsibility for the protection of the incarcerated population of New York City. So I'm going to take you in, in, into the time just before lunch on the journey that I've taken to better understand this issue, one that was really triggered by a national recognition of the ongoing impact of police violence in our country. I thought I would start by quoting a leading black sociologist. I won't ask you to raise cards as to guess who it was, um, who shared three findings uh, and a report. He said that the police show little regard for human rights and violate the right, fundamental rights of black citizens, that police aggression and brutality more than any other factor weld people together for mass action against those responsible for their ills, and that it is the responsibility of the police to act in such a way as to win the confidence of its, our citizens and to pr prove themselves as guardians of the rights and safety of a community rather than as its enemies and oppressors. This was E. Franklin Fraser writing 80 years ago. 
So I think that we should all reflect as we begin Black History Month on how far we've come, and this is a familiar refrain in public health, how far we have still to go. So I'm very proud to be a health commissioner that can have a title of a talk that includes the word racism. And I want to acknowledge the role of our mayor, Bill de Blasio, who came to office uh, on a platform that acknowledged the widening and unsustainable gap between rich and poor in our city and across our nation. And of course, the conversation that we're having today had its roots in widely uh, uh, publicized deaths that occurred. Uh, Eric Garner in New York City in July of 2014, Michael Brown in Ferguson uh, in August, uh, then followed by, in the spring of last year, the death of Freddie Gray. These were deaths that spurred protests across our nation. These took protests took place day and night. Uh, and I think that we can continue to uh, expect them to take place, but th because these were not the first or the only deaths of black men uh, in recent years, but they captured the public imagination because all three men were unarmed and their deaths became a symbol for the daily violence and the fear that black communities face at the hands of government institution that is supposed to protect. So I'm going to start in honor of Black History Month by uh, saying a little bit about history. I'm not a historian, but I, uh, I, but I have tried to um, try to put this in context. Uh, then I'm going to talk about our work in public health and how many of the th comments that I want to make have already been made this morning uh, by my colleagues who come out of completely different disciplines and talking about expanding this from a narrow conversation about the impact on individuals to how this affects whole communities uh, and affects us all. And I'm going to end up by talking about what we're doing in New York City to envision a path forward and um, some of these have already been highlighted. Just to remind us all that civil uprisings took place across the United States throughout the 20th century. And what has occurred uh, uh, last year and the year before uh, was presaged by the Watts uprisings in 1965, which I remember. People thought, you know, they have palm trees there. What's going on? That they, uh, and all of these were really tied to uh, a history and some of our young questioners uh, have referred to this, that have invented and reinvented, enforced and reinforced the criminalization of black bodies. And that began with the foundational, before the Mayflower, experience of the enslavement of people of African descent, uh, uh, enslavement that went on for two and a half centuries. I don't think it takes anybody's uh, imagination uh, to ask the question, how do you keep people enslaved for two and a half centuries? And the answer is with pure terror. Uh, that's how it's done. So we have uh, also enshrined this in our foundational documents, um, speaking also to our young questioners, where in our Constitution, uh, people of, who were enslaved were considered three-fifths of a human being. Now, this always sounds very offensive, but it had an impact that I didn't realize till I read a little more. It increased the number of eligible voters in the southern states. Uh, the, although they, uh, the enslaved population obviously didn't have the right to vote, a vote, a right that only was really Entrenched, entrenched in my lifetime uh, with the voting rights and civil rights legislation of the mid-1960s, uh, blacks uh, equaled out the voting, uh, the voting roles of the white South, and, and some people argue enabled Thomas Jefferson to be elected as our third president. Uh, we had a respite in the Reconstruction period, though, which ended, however, with the black codes, uh, with the establishment of vacancy laws, and the re-enslavement of, uh, 
of blacks using another word. We moved on from that to the Jim Crow period, a period that lasted um, uh, over uh, ni about 90 years. Uh, and I was lucky enough to come of age uh, during this period of 1965 to 1980, a period in which uh, uh, huge advances and opportunities became available to people of African descent in many ways for the first time. And we're now here. We saw those graphs with a steep rise in mass incarceration that ended that period that we now know as the Civil Rights Movement and have, um, have begun to, uh, and have continued to shape the conversation that we have today. Now, the civil rights period was not without, um, without impact. I mean, it wasn't all a give away to the black population. This is a graph that was put together by Nancy Krieger um, and her colleagues really in the wake of, uh, of Ferguson. And it shows deaths by legal intervention. I don't know if you can make it. Uh, this is 19, do I have a marker here? Yeah. Uh, this is 1970 here. And it shows the top lines are the um, deaths due to legal interventions among young men. The top lines are, are black men. Uh, this is the higher income group here. Uh, and this is the lower income group. What's really interesting about deaths due to legal intervention is that they don't show for either blacks or whites much variation by income, uh, which is something that we actually ex often expect to see in public health data. The difference is, sorry, uh, here, uh, here where there, this represents the urban uprisings of the uh, 1960s, uh, which occurred in urban areas which were largely uh, more um, more um, affluent. I, I just point this out to show you the importance of academia in bringing data to the conversation. Uh, these data were rapidly put into print and I think have been very useful uh, to us. So we are now in a period where we, according to a New York Times uh, article uh, recently, uh, have 1.5 million black men in the prime of life who are missing from daily life, either through incarceration or through premature mortality. So let me talk about the impact of this on health. And uh, we, um, we've been thinking about it in these buckets, uh, that it isn't only when people are in the hands of the criminal justice system that we see the impact of the criminal justice system on our population. It begins with policing, uh, which before the election of Mayor Bill de Blasio uh, the, included the stop and frisk policy in New York City where uh, upwards of 700,000 stops were being made a year in some neighborhoods. On average, every resident of that neighborhood was stopped once a day. Uh, that, I'm happy to say, has changed. and. Uh, but then uh, goes on to arrest, to jail and prison. And importantly, and this I want to encourage all of you in the academy to think of as an area for future research to the release and reentry uh, of, uh, of incarcerated individuals back into the communities. And across this continuum, we see uh, uh, an impact that extends not only on the individuals uh, who may experience um, great loss of life, uh, affecting the family, uh, affecting whole neighborhoods, and of course, affecting uh, broader communities. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples that are shown in this slide, the case of Tamir Rice, who was just 12 years old at the time he was shot and killed by police officers in Cleveland, uh, obviously, at, at age 12, he lost and his family lost a tremendous number of potential years' lives lost. Uh, I estimate about 60 if we take the life expectancy for black men at about 71 years in this country. 
uh, seven, 60 years that he could have contributed to his community. The slide underneath is of a young man named Ramarley Grahams, uh, who was pursued into his apartment and shot dead in the uh, presence of his grandmother and his six-year-old brother. Uh, so when we think about direct health effects, we need to think not only of the cost paid by the individuals who are uh, affected by, um, uh, by interactions with legal intervention, but of the families that are witness to and victims as well uh, as the people who've lost their lives. So we need to think more about how this affects the whole life experience of people uh, living in areas where uh, police surveillance is high. Uh, the fact that people may decide not to go outside and exercise, something that I as health commissioner tell people to do. Uh, we, it may affect uh, uh, the whole concept of safety in neighborhoods uh, when people feel that they may be harassed or even detained by police. Uh, we in New York City have uh, a, uh, many high schools where students have to go through metal detectors every day. Uh, and an analysis that was done recently shows that those, you know, this won't surprise anybody here because as Glenn pointed out, I'm preaching to the choir here. But there's the streaming world out there who may also be sharing these conversations. And those high schools are located in neighborhoods which have high degrees of incarceration, high degrees of other chronic disease. And in these neighborhoods, kids start out their school day uh, first being treated as though they might be armed and going through a medical metal detector. So we have to think about what impact that might have on the quality of education that is offered. And these are all questions that I think are researchable questions and ones that we should challenge the academy to help us in the public sector to better understand. I'm going to turn um, to something that's already been talked about, that this history, this legacy, means that we have many people who, consider, who misperceive the experience of crime in this country. They think that crime is driven entirely by people of African descent or overwhelmingly, when the data show that this is not the case. As in, uh, as in other uh, areas in which stereotypes exist, such as the people who are Medicaid beneficiaries or beneficiaries of cash public assistance, whites are arrested more often uh, for violent crimes than individuals of other, res uh, other races. Uh, but we have just heard a whole presentation on how the impact of crime and the likelihood of harsh sentencing is uh, disproportionately experienced by black Americans, uh, more likely to be uh, the recipients of mandatory sentences uh, and more likely to go to prison. And I am sure that this is something that all of you are aware of, but I think it's worth just showing the graph again. And when we talk about reducing by 50%, we are nowhere close to achieving the levels of incarceration that are experienced by peer nations. When I became health commissioner on Rikers Island, which Mr. Martin kindly pointed out to me, he intends to see to it that it's closed, um, the uh, number of people in solitary confinement on Rikers Island exceeded the number of people in solitary confinement in all the United Kingdom. That's England, uh, England uh, Scotland, and Wales. Uh, and, or is Ireland in there? Sorry, not, not Scotland maybe now. Uh, England, Wales, and Ireland. Uh, so New York City has the second largest jail system in, uh, in the uh, United States. Uh, uh, city jail system, LA is bigger, but it, LA of course is a county. Uh, but you can see where we stand. And this here is the, um, the uh, incarceration when we look at it separately for, for the rate for the black community. And I think 
I'm, you know, I, 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 talk, I have two daughters. I talk with them about this often um, because we do need to talk about the, the burden borne by black women. Uh, but we have to look at the data and just see the absolutely excessive burden borne by black men. Uh, a fact and I, that I, maybe I can use the card system for once in my talk because I didn't integrate it. But in the mid 1940s, whites achieved a life expectancy of about 65 years. Um, black women achieved a life expectancy. That's often the cut point we use for premature mortality. Um, uh, black women achieved this in 1955. Anyone want to guess whether, um, I don't know how to do it with the card, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm, I, I'm just gonna tell you the answer. <laughs> that black men achieved a stable life expectancy of 65 years in the mid 1990s. So uh, I, you know, so I, I think that we have to acknowledge that there has been a particular um, uh, uh, targeting um, that uh, and that black men have borne a particular burden. So what does this mean uh, for the health of our populations? Well, I am a medical doctor, uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't point out to you that, that, uh, that people who are incarcerated concentrate the occurrence of common infectious diseases. Uh, we see higher rates of HIV AIDS, uh, other sexually transmitted infections. In New York City, uh, we estimate that uh, something between two and three percent of our uh, popula adult population as a whole is infected with hepatitis C, and this proportion in uh, patients in our jail system stands at 20 percent. So this means that, uh, that jail health services have the opportunity to make people healthier return them to their communities healthier. Uh, but there also is the risk that, that disease transmission occurs within the jail system and that we may return people to jails less healthy. The jails also have uh, are a violent environment. Um, uh, Rikers Island is literally on an island. Uh, you get there by crossing a bridge and when you cross that bridge it's really like going into an alternative universe. And we know that, um, you know, that a high proportion of inmates report violence-related uh, injuries uh, that in our hands in the uh, Correctional Health Services, uh, we identified that uh, about three-quarters of those injuries were, um, uh, were were in fact violence related. You know, you can injure yourself by slipping on the floor or falling off a ladder or something. We, but most of these are the result of intentional uh, violence. This is a, 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 a this is a video that's available online uh, uh, of a young man who was uh, captured by correctional officers. Uh, he was hogtied and beaten. Uh, that's Robert Hinton. Uh, that's what he looked like in 2012 uh, after he'd been beaten by correctional officers. So we have um, uh, a problem that, um, that we have to both monitor and address of the occurrence of violence within jails. And sadly, the leading cause of death uh, within our jail system in New York City is suicide. Uh, the... Um, the fact that we have an electronic health record in something that the, was introduced by the health department uh, when it took over the uh, delivery of jail health services allows us to gather data that we wouldn't be otherwise able to gather. And it's allowed us to see uh, the, um, the fact, uh, it's allowed us to document the impact of solitary confinement on self-harm. Uh, what we found is that people who are in solitary confinement are nearly seven times as likely uh, to hurt themselves as other inmates, and that this risk is greatly increased by the presence of a concomitant mental health diagnosis 
and among adolescent uh, inmates. Uh, these data have helped to drive the decision in New York City that solitary confinement will be about, has been abolished for 16 and 17 year olds. Uh, the, we have um, had uh, deaths uh, due to, um, to, due to um, uh, inmates who were um, not appropriately uh, diagnosed. Uh, this is Bradley Ballard, uh, uh, who had serious mental illness and uh, died in our uh, jail system. Uh, I haven't said much about, um, about the problem of mental health in our jail system. And I think that that is um, because it's so difficult to disentangle how poor mental health evolves uh, while people are incarcerated at admission, if we want to call it that, during their entrance physical exam, about between 5 and 7 percent of, um, of inmates coming into Rikers have a serious mental illness. That's a little bit higher than the general population. But at any given time, 40 percent of inmates have a mental health diagnosis. That's really high. And it's, uh, these include diagnoses like adjustment disorder, um, conditions that people acquire while incarcerated. Uh, and uh, so I, I would welcome a conversation about how, to what extent, uh, we're putting people in settings which are very unhealthy for their mental health and, uh, and the extent to which people have mental health issues on entry. Uh, both are true uh, because we heard that you know, there have been, um, there, there has been a displacement of substance use and mental health treatment to the jail system. Uh, but it also is true that we see people deteriorate while in our jails. And how many of you, this is a card question, know the word drapetomania? Wow, drapetomania. Nobody, ah, well, all right, finally a mixed answer. <laughs> This was a disease diagnosed in the 19th century. It was called the disease calling, causing slaves to run away. And it was treated with whipping. Uh, so obviously, we in the medical profession do have a history of medicalizing rebellion. And drapetomania was an example of that. And I would challenge us to ask the question, uh, whether we are doing that, again, in our jails. Now, of course, uh, so the jail is not a good place to be, uh, and everybody agrees on that. And the a primary uh, concept in public health is primary prevention. Keeping some an exposure from ever happening is the best strategy. So the absolute best strategy for uh, reducing the impact of criminal justice systems on health is to keep people out of jail. So I couldn't agree more that we need to reduce the number of people uh, who are incarcerated. But of course we have to recognize that the impact isn't only on these individuals. When people uh, come home, uh, they take with them uh, diseases, uh, mental health issues, uh, trauma that they may, that ha are related to incarceration. Uh, and they return home to, how, to families that have been disrupted uh, by the a loss of, um, of the incarcerated individual, their loss as a parent, as a breadwinner. Um, we have a huge number of children who are living with a parent uh, who is incarcerated. And of course, uh, we have people returning to neighborhoods which are going to, deal with voter disenfranchisement because we continue to have uh, across our nation and including uh, in my state uh, uh, felony disenfranchisement and restrictions that uh, limit the p political capital of neighborhoods which carry, um, uh, which carry high incarceration rates. And we've already all ha heard mentioned by several people today uh, the case of Khalif Browder, uh, a young man who was 
deeply traumatized by his experience in uh, New York City's jail system uh, and sadly committed suicide. His experience was invoked by our president uh, when he uh, has took action on solitary confinement. This is an important map because it shows the, um, the relationship uh, between incarceration and the many other causes of ill health. Uh, you can see there in the, the black map uh, shows this is men admitted to prison. So everybody who goes to prison uh, from New York City goes through Rikers. Uh, so, but it doesn't capture the people who go to Rikers and then get released, which is the majority of people who go to Rikers. So this is just uh, prison. Um, and you can see that the dark colors in red there uh, look more or less like the same neighborhoods where we experience premature mortality rates. Uh, premature mortality is not driven by incarceration. It's driven by heart disease, uh, by uh, diabetes, by cancer, by HIV. Uh, and so you can see that there is a real relationship between the burden of incarceration and the broader burden of ill health. Uh, it's, this is a slide that I showed to many different audiences that shows uh, hospitalizations across a range of conditions which have nothing to do with each other from a biological, biomedical viewpoint. Asthma is not related to HIV in terms of what causes it, nor is it related to diabetes. Well, maybe a little bit, obesity. Um, drug hospitalizations, but when you look across all of these varied conditions, you see the same neighborhoods light up, the same neighborhoods where we see uh, high rates of, uh, of uh, sending men to prisons. And that has to raise for us the idea that there's something deeper, something structural that is going on, that is driving the patterns of ill health in our communities. And that has a lot to do with the intersection between poverty and race. In New York City, uh, when you talk about who's poor and who's black or brown, you're talking virtually about the same population. Uh, this is a graph that shows the distribution of the non-white population in New York City uh, against the uh, poor population of New York City. And you can see that the graphs are virtually overlapping. So, all right, that's the problem. I didn't mean to depress you. <laughs> because all of that is changeable, right? Uh, to quote myself, uh, these are constructed, <laughs> these are constructed uh, 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 um, phenomenon. They're not in our genes. Uh, the fact that our zip code is a more important determinant of our health than our genetic code, for me, is a good thing. Uh, because we can change the distribution of wealth uh, by neighborhoods much more rapidly than we can ever change our, our genetic code. And, of course, the fact that we see these maps uh, show such broad disparities uh, by neighborhood reflects the fact that New York City is a deeply segregated city. If by some measures, it's the third most segregated city in the United States uh, by, by race. Uh, so uh, now I want to turn and, and talk about some of the things that I think we can do and some of the things that I've been thinking about from the point of view of the health department. And I want to acknowledge Ida B. Wells. I think that, um, that um, Cornell Brooks um, mentioned her. Um, I don't remember who mentioned her. Was it him? Uh, but this was a pioneering woman who uh, spoke out against uh, the epidemic of lynching that began after the end of the Reconstruction period and extended uh, over uh, until the middle of the 20th century and had, a, had a, a broad impact on the Great Migration out of the South. It was the range of the, the sort of um, uh, kind of reign of terror that existed in the, the Southern states. So she started counting lynchings. Well, I uh, want to acknowledge the work done by Nancy Krieger. I showed you some of her data e earlier uh, in making the case that we should be treating fatal shootings as reportable conditions. We should be treating it as a public health statistic. Ironically, right now, 
the best place that we can get data about the uh, impact of police violence and deaths due to legal interventions is from a U United Kingdom newspaper. Now, this is really embarrassing. And it's not me who said that. It was the head of the FBI <laughs> who noted that it is deeply embarrassing. And they've announced that they're going to be changing this and that, um, that the, there will begin to be more data collection at federal level. Uh, but I do want to bring to your um, attention a, um, a website called The Counted um, that is published by the Guardian newspaper from the United Kingdom. Uh, last year, over 1,100 individuals were captured, more than twice the number that are, appeared in official statistics. Um, and uh, the, the Guardian has done a real uh, service for us all. Uh, they said that they were doing this because the U.S. government has no comprehensive record of the number of people killed by law enforcement. And the lack of these basic data has been glaring amid the protests. Uh, the riots and the worldwide debate. And before he stepped down as uh, U.S. Uh, Attorney General Eric Holder uh, described the situation as unacceptable. And as I noted, the uh, head of the FBI described it as embarrassing. But public health has been uh, step stepping out on, uh, on the uh, on the whole issue, uh, and the American Public Health Association uh, has been speaking out and recommended over a decade ago that these data should be collected by public health authorities. Uh, however, uh, there's never been a, a national decision um, that, 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 that this should happen, and I, I think that now we're in the position to have a national debate. Um, we also, in public health, are beginning to name racism as one of the determinants of health uh, inequities and have been working with other disciplines to, um, uh, and that's part of what I've gained from being here today, uh, to talking with people in, um, in the whole area of criminal justice reform. Um, to broaden our efforts to ensure that we monitor the problem so that we can see whether our interventions are succeeding. Now, under the um, leadership of Bill de Blasio, New York City has been taking some, ep uh, some actions. Uh, one of the early things that he did was put together a mayor's task force on behavioral health and the criminal justice system. Uh, this uh, resulted in a number, it was a 100-day initiative and resulted in a number of um, recommendations along that whole pathway. Of, uh, of the criminal justice system. Uh, it included training for police officers with the goal that 50% of our police officers should be trained in crisis intervention. I'm really pleased that there have been uh, reforms to solitary confinement, that uh, 16 and 17 year olds on Rikers are no longer subject to solitary confinement and the uh, Department of Corrections has committed to extending this to all uh, young adults on Rikers. Uh, we have, uh, are among the cities uh, that have successfully banned the box uh, with legislation that went into effect at the end of last year. Uh, we, um, we had um, an, uh, one of the photos that I showed you was of um, a man who was a former Marine, uh, had a mental health diagnosis and was arrested uh, because he was trespassing on public housing grounds. He ended up at Rikers where he died in an overheated cell. And um, so uh, his case led to a whole conversation about what, where can people be taken when they're picked up by the police. There are three places where they've typically been taken, to emergency departments, to jail, uh, and... Uh, to, and I've lost the third one, somebody help me here. Homeless shelters, yes. <laughs> um, homeless shelters, we have mental health homeless shelters. Those are the, and people cycle through those three systems. So we are now in the process of uh, developing something that we're calling diversion centers, drop-off centers, where people can go 
where, so they won't enter the homeless shelter system, they won't end up in the emergency department uh, or in our jail system, and they'll be trained people who can keep them there for a couple of days. Many times people have been come to disconnected from care. Uh, so that's what's uh, being planned among other activities under the New York City SAFE initiative. Uh, so we are making uh, some progress uh, in uh, trying to um, meet our goal of reducing the number of people who are entering the criminal justice system by having these diversion centers, by trying to reconnect people to their social supports and community supports during the pre-arraignment process with the hope that we that then their lawyers can go before the judge saying this person can be reconnected to their service provision, uh, working with the Department of Crisis Interventions to reduce the level of violence in the jails and to ensure that people are reconnected to care on, uh, on, on discharge. So these are things that are a beginning. Uh, I would remind you that they are not, um, they, we are not finished. We do have uh, Rikers Island still with us. Uh, the daily census is now down below 10,000, uh, but it is a large, some people have described it as a penal colony, uh, which uh, continues even though it is now at half the census that it was in the 1990s. Uh, we still have a much higher rate of incarceration than we should. And I'm hopeful that public health will play a public, uh, a, a progressive role in this conversation. Uh, but I think it's worthwhile ending with the observation that public health has a checkered history. Uh, that sometimes our, uh, we have uh, been on the side of progress. Uh, but there have been times when we have, uh, have hampered progress. And I'm committed to seeing that we advance uh, the overarching goal of reducing the number of people held in our criminal, in our city jails. Uh, but I also want to be mindful uh, that when we talk about, um, when we talk about our modern day drapetomanias, uh, that we also have the risk of playing a less than progressive role. So thank you very much for your <laughs> attention. And I've, I have a few minutes for questions, I think, if, or comments. I want to acknowledge that we, I have somebody here from my own department, uh, Sarah Sisko, one of our researchers. Uh, so she should feel free to ask questions too. <laughs> uh, um, I, um, I'm from the Boston Public Health Commission, so I wanted both to welcome you to Boston and to thank you for your leadership among urban public health departments when you wrote an article about Ferguson. I thought that really opened the door to a conversation in public health about so thank you. Thank a, you. A comment, I wanted to make a comment and a question. The comment is that one alignment you didn't show is with infant mortality, which is where mm -hmm. I do a lot of work. And in Boston, the number of um, black deaths due to homicide is very close to the number of black infants who die um, in the first year of life. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the same forces are probably at work, and it would be interesting, I think, to look more closely at that. The, the question I had is very specific to your role in um, in prison health, and that's, I, as I understood from what you were saying, um, young people who are incarcerated go to Rikers, and also from uh, Khalif Brower's uh, history, go to Rikers as well as adults, is that, is yes. that right? Yes, 16 and 17 year olds, 16. I think uh, Glenn pointed out earlier in the day, uh, the adult, so, age of adulthood is 16. So when they are exposed to the conditions at Rikers that have been described, what happens to the mandated reporting responsibilities of correctional officers, presumably, um, but also anybody from the health system who goes into the prison? I mean, it, you, you would think that that would be a sort of huge barrier to abusive treatment of children in that system, um, but it doesn't seem to be working. So, I, Sure. I, I think what you're saying is uh, our uh, Rikers inmates uh, 
subject to the protections of our uh, administration for children's services, which is our child protection agency. And my understanding is that the, a, a child of 16 is considered an adult uh, when they are arrested in New York City. So there are obviously conversations about this. Uh, they are considered a vulnerable class. That's why uh, the Department of Corrections Commissioner d made the decision that 16 and 17 year olds shouldn't be subject to solitary confinement. In part, that had to do with the health department's data that showed that adolescents were at a particularly high risk of having adverse outcomes while in solitary confinement, but they do not have the protections of the uh, of the Child Protection Agency while in jail. Sarah. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bassett. Um, I guess my question was related to your slide, and forgive me because I'm in a different, uh, I'm in a different um, office at the moment, but um, I noticed that there's the Mayor's Task Force on the Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice, and the ones you had listed up there, um, I didn't see our health department necessarily spearheading any of those, so maybe could you speak to, I guess, the, the ways mm -hmm. in which, certainly beyond mm -hmm. data and vital statistics, we are supporting those efforts, and potentially if there are other directions that you envision through the Center for Health Equity and the work that you're doing. Sure. Sure. So I, I, it's true, I did hand highlight the importance of surveillance data, and I, I do want to say that the data are really important, and uh, as we've learned today, also the stories are really important, and uh, some, of the, uh, com you know, some of the conversations we had earlier in the day uh, were more about stories. So we have responsibility directly for the uh, uh, big chunks of what's called NYC SAFE. Uh, that is, was an effort to... Uh, many of, uh, of these things are triggered by things that catch public and press attention. Uh, we had a series of horrible events in New York City, uh, violent events re that were perpetrated by people who were apparently mentally ill. And the question is, wh why, why do we find out about them uh, when they do something terrible? Uh, deaths, a death of a shelter director, uh, um, who was uh, oversaw a mental health shelter, uh, a mom who, whose baby died. So there, the uh, NYC SAFE includes a huge expansion of both um, uh, of, of outreach teams uh, who are going to be available to go to the shelters and to other settings uh, where somebody uh, is concerned about the person, a person with mental illness. Uh, so that they, uh, it's really a, a, an alternative to calling 911, although no one who feels that's, um, I, I guess everybody uses 911. Uh, nobody should delay calling uh, 911 if they feel there's an immediate risk. But if there's somebody who you're concerned about, you feel like they haven't kept their appointments, they seem to be deteriorating, the health department is uh, greatly expanding its outreach teams and that's being done under our Division of Mental Hygiene and uh, um, represents a massive investment. The whole city is doing, a, uh, is really re-looking re at how we deal with mental health issues and uh, our First Lady made this a centerpiece of her role as First Lady, a really courageous decision, I think, um, and um, has, uh, the, the administration's committed to over $800 million going into mental health and bolstering these services over the next four years. Thank you for giving me the chance to toot our own horn a bit. Yes. Um, so living in a society and um, being in public health, uh, knowing that one in three black males on average usually for nonviolent crimes go to jail. Less than 1% of rapists ever actually see jail time. It takes a woman up to seven times on average to leave an abusive man. And you know we're counseling drug addicts uh, to, if, when they call the police, not to say if somebody is overdosing and just to tell them that 
they're not breathing or else the police will take much longer to show up. Um, having all of this kind of information, I, I guess my question is why in public health we don't have more, more conversations about disbanding the police because it seems to me that a lot of these issues would be much better addressed by trained social workers and um, the racism, classism, and sexism is really ingrained in police forces and so many of them are not trained in crisis intervention and how to deal with so many of these problems. Well, uh, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> but where I think, I, I think um, that most <coughs> societies see a need for some entity to oversee public security and safety. That's the police. Their slogan in New York City is protect and serve. And I think it's our job to hold them to their slogan. Uh, I... Um, so I, you know, I, I, I think it's a provocative question that um, that raises the question: Why aren't we getting the services that we want from our police force, or why aren't we not complementing the police force with the needed skills? Which I think Dr. Ganush was saying, uh, not expecting them to act like social workers with a gun. Uh, but uh, having social workers who can be deployed, that's what part of what these uh, mental health outreach teams are supposed to do. Uh, but <coughs> I don't see uh, much chance that we're going to disband the police force. And I can't imagine that as health commissioner I would make such a call to disband the police force. Um, Yeah. Oh, I think in New York City, our police force is 36,000 people. That's quite a police force. So I, the, I, I would point out that, I, and I probably should have prefaced my presentation by saying that many of these issues belong to us as citizens, uh, not just as professionals. And that many of these are conversations that we need to have as a society. Uh, not only under the heading of sort of uh, technical skills. Uh, these are, you're raising questions about values uh, and about the social allocation of resources. Uh, these are our broader social questions that are important for us to engage with. I hardly ever go before any audience uh, without reminding them that it's really important that everybody should register and vote we have an important election coming up. Uh, we need people to get out there and register and vote. One more. I think the question about words of wisdom from, is this on? It is. Sorry. Words of wisdom from Africa. You, you were there 20 years. Yes. And uh, some of us in the public health world are familiar with that African proverb, uh, takes a whole village to raise a child. Do you think it would be useful to the movement that Glenn uh, and Michelle Alexander say we need to come up with another, turn that around a little bit? Um, maybe it takes a whole village to put one in prison, and it takes a whole village to get one out successfully, because uh, we often, especially the worst crimes, it's all on the individual. Um, and we s seem to look at it that way. We turn away real quick when somebody commits murder or sexual crime. Um, do we need to remind ourselves that, again, that, that, that proverb is worth, worth a lot? Well, thanks for that. I, I think it's rooted in our own history that, uh, that the idea of social cohesion, social solidarity are really critical, um, critical concepts to our well-being and that the impact of the current state of our criminal justice system is not only on the individuals who get enmeshed in it, but on whole communities which have had their fabric shredded uh, by the, the experience of both police violence and high incarceration rates. 
I'm not sure that I have any particular words of wisdom that come from, in that regard, that come from Africa. But I, I do want to end on, 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 uh, you know, on a note that several people echoed, that we really are at a moment at, at this time in which we're seeing conversations taking place that I haven't seen take place since I was a university student myself. And this is really important. We need to grab it with both hands. Uh, we don't have to have all the answers to call for change. We just have to be prepared to be brave. So thank you very much.